Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. We're going to get right to the show after these messages. This is Maddie Dalrymple, the author of the Anne Kinnear Suspense Novels and Suspense Shorts, and you're listening to Mysterious Goings On. The central human emotion of uh, a craving for adventure is often at cross purposes with the lack of humility that the modern uh, modern humanity seems to have these days, or, or I guess the, the, the humility that we lack to a large degree. And that's why I'm very excited and interested to talk to our guest today, because he has written wonderful adventure stories, but they also hold with them a respect for um, nature, the planet, as well as a clear understanding of where humanity may actually be um, as we find ourselves today with you, with our technology, uh, and this is me uh, uh, editorializing, leaping in leaps and bounds ahead of where we are emotionally as a species. So we're going to find out Charlie agrees with that or not in a minute. We really welcome Charlie uh, Sheldon here to Mysterious Goings On. Charlie went to Yale and UMass where he received a master's degree in wildlife biology resource management. He's worked in the fishing industry for 15 years as a deckhand, mate, skipper, and consultant, then relocated to the Pacific Northwest in 1990 to be near Olympic National Park. In other words, he's lived the life I always dreamt I should have. He worked at seaports for New 30 years as a planner, project manager, and executive. When he retired from seaports in 2012, he returned to sea as a merchant sailor for four years, working on various container and military vessels as able-bodied seaman and bosun. He retired in 2016 to work full-time in his writing, and nowadays he hikes in the Olympic National Park whenever he can, cooks for his wife, pesters his grandchildren, and continues to scribble tales and finds a little bit of time to speak to you here on Mysterious Goings On. Charlie Sheldon, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks a lot. Did I get it somewhat right in my intro? Um, do you? I, I've read a lot of your stuff on humility. It seems to me you and I might agree on that to a degree that maybe man is at a place, we're at an inflection point where um, uh, our the reach of our technological ability has exceeded the grasp of our our maturity as a species. Is that something that's kind of close to what you're saying? Partly. I mean, I, I think that's correct. I, I was actually. I'm saying something a little different I think and maybe it is the same thing but I think what I'm saying is that I think because of our technological accomplishments which are un unbelievable we've lost the ability to understand that we don't know everything we we think we know everything we think we can actually we now we have the arrogance to think that somehow we can re-engineer the climate so we can modify it, the impacts that we're supposedly having on the climate that's a pretty arrogant assumption. <laughs> and, and my thesis, which emerged from writing these, I didn't start with this. I mean, this is almost on reflection after I finished all my tales, which is that we, if you believe in evolution, <laughs> and actually many people don't, but if you believe in evolution, then we humans, the people we are, have evolved most of our time of evolution was before farming, was in the period when we were hunter-gatherers. We were small groups. We were not the apex predator. The big animals were the apex predators. We lived in a time of great ice and huge climate shifts with ice changes. And we had by necessity to, we knew we didn't know everything. And we, and we needed to somehow find a way to survive in the face of awesome forces. And I think we've lost that to some degree because of our technological abilities. And yet we're still the same beings we were back in, in the ice age. And so to some degree, I think nowadays we, 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 we push this idea that we can do everything, but we, we actually might benefit from admitting we don't know everything Maybe we ought to listen to the other side a little bit more or, you know, just so I, I'm maybe we ought to just cool it and slow down a little bit. It's, it seems to me today people are so busy shouting at each other about oh, yeah. their various points of view and 
and and I actually when I started writing this series, I I wanted to write a, a chapter on each of the deadly sins, which was way beyond my capability. And but then I realized as I thought about all this that there's there is I believe a, an eighth deadly sin, or maybe it's the first deadly sin, and that's the sin of zealotry of people who are convinced they're right and they need to tell everybody else how to think and how to live. And to me, that's the way the road there the road from that leads straight to hell in my opinion yeah. so i'm not sure i answered your question but i mean we're very similar in, in thinking of, of of this i don't yeah i don't think we're perfectly aligned but i i think you can see where i tried to look what i tried to do here charlie i tried to put how i think onto you i tried to see i tried to do confirmation bias on you and say okay charlie's totally agree with me here but what i love is that we're both here across the across the miles looking at each other through a screen and we're both realizing hey wow we, we kind of, here's the things we do agree upon. And what you're saying, I think, is that not enough people are doing that. You wrote on your on your uh, blog, and this is on charliesheldon2.com. The two is a numeral. I'll put a link in the show notes. There's this great piece called uh, Screamers on Fish Boats. <laughs> and dude, I'm going to tell you, can, can, would I be, is it okay if I read a little bit of it? Is that all right sure, with you? Or, sure, sure. Uh, and this is the this is the end of it but folks trust me it's not a long thing it's not too long too long didn't read kind of thing it's worth your time but the, this is this is the part this is the uh, thesis here uh, charlie says it seems to me that the reason it feels like we have screamers everywhere and, and he explains what screamers are in a fishing boat and uh you go read it for yourself so you can hear all this detail but Anyway, as I said, he it screams. It seems to me that the reason it feels like we have screamers everywhere in politics, in the media, on school playgrounds, must have something to do with forgetting that we cannot have a community unless people listen and speak carefully, meaning are humble with themselves and others. At sea, in the microcosm world that was limited to the boat, a screamer was toxic, dangerous, and inflected the entire world. In ancient times, such a person was driven from the tribe, shunned, left to wander alone. Maybe we could use a little more of that now because with all the screaming going on, people lose sight of what they don't know, what they need to learn and what they should be doing to keep the community strong. Um, couldn't agree more. I, I think there's a, there is all this, you know, Sturm und Drang and, and all these, this, the sound and fury signifying that there's all of these things that take away from the, uh, the, the basic humanity. It's, it's not that we need to get into this, but just, just turn on your TV and the mask debate and the vaccine debate and all these things where it's, yeah. everybody's about their feelings and not about what's right for the community as a whole, in my opinion. So, uh, and Charlie, I know you did not want to come on the show and talk all about this stuff, but I, I just had to start off with this because it really did move me and it makes me want to, of course, read your books. Well, thanks. Thanks. So let's talk about these books, shall we? Um, let's, let's hear your rundown on, on what you've been writing. And uh, now I got a few questions here and there. Uh, okay, so I've wanted to write all my life and have written all my life, and I've written a number of novels, uh, some published, some self-published. I, I, when I came to the Northwest in 1990, uh, where I always wanted to come, I was working for a, a port out here, the Port of Seattle, and I became very involved with having to deal with conflicts between tribal fishermen and ships coming into the harbor, and I, I did that for 15 years. It was the most interesting work of all the work I've ever done dealing with this issue. It was fascinating. And along the way, hopefully I learned a little bit about uh, tribal history and what, what the, you know, the first people who lived here who were very much present today in the Northwest, unlike New England, where I'm from, where it was 300 years ago. And I learned very soon that there, there's a legend in most Native American or first people cultures that says they've always been here. They didn't come over on the land bridge. They've always been here. In fact, if you tell them they came over in the land bridge, this makes them really the most recent group of humans on the earth. And that's seen as an insult, <laughs> and maybe rightfully so. So they think they've always been here. So I noodled with this. I thought, you know, could this be true? How could it be true? And that was one issue. And then I did a lot of hiking in the Olympic National Park, which is partly why we moved out here. I mean, I wanted to do this. And it's it's just a treasure and it's one of the, the last unknown wilderness in the continental us was in the olympic national park and that was more than 120 years ago so i wanted to write a story about the olympics hiking in the olympics and the gulf of, and being in the gulf of laxter i wanted to write something with a sea story in it because I, I i've spent a lot of time at sea and i wanted to play with this legend and see how i could integrate that into a story and finally the last thing was you, know, you need a vehicle to tell a story and the vehicle I wanted to work with was 
something about a coming of age with a troubled teen trying to find their power. And I ended up finding a, a develop a character came to me and it wasn't a young boy, which you'd think might be the case to go into the wilderness. You know, I'm revealing my sexist background maybe, but so what I ended up with was, a, was an ornery young girl, Sarah Cooley, and she finds her power and strength in an impossible way, impossible way. And, and, and that started this story. And originally it was just going to be a story, one book, yeah. but it turned right. into a series and we can talk about how that happened. But that's basically what it is, is it's, and there's magic realism in these stories. In other words, it's, it's I'm very, I love the, the magic realism genre, if you can call it that, where there's a normal world, but there's one or two things that really are not possible. <laughs> and if you write it the correct way, most readers will go with it. They'll just accept it. Some readers don't, but many do. And I tried to, I th think back to your earlier point about humility. There's a lot of ways to get a horse to drink water, right? And one thing with magic realism and writing, just like with science fiction and writing, is it enables you to get the reader to imagine things that are outside the current dogma of thought an approach and only then can you maybe get them to see things a little bit differently not that i was trying to get people to see things differently i was just telling a story you know and ultimately it's just a story right and if, right. But if you fall into the story maybe at the end of it if i'm really successful you'll be thinking well could that be true how could that be true could he be right that's that's what you want you want people to be in the story and then to be provoked enough when the story's over to be thinking about it still. That's all right. you can ask for as a writer. It is absolutely right. So, so I have a 13, well, in a month, a third, well, by the time this airs, by the way, 13 year old daughter. And I, okay. boy, you're a, you are a better writer than me. I cannot imagine trying to get into her head to write this kind of story. Was that difficult for you? Well, yes and no. I mean, obviously there's a whole thesis these days in the, in writing about, you know, if you're not, if you're not a woman, you can't write about women. If you're not a man, you can't write, you know, and, and if you're not, if you're of this culture, you can't write about that culture. And that's, I think, defies the whole purpose of imagination and writing. Agreed. But what, I, what I did was I, I, um, I had some, I've had some experience with, uh, including some of my own experience when I was very young, but I've had experience with kids have really struggled, you know, really struggled. And I learned with, with watching this with friends of my kids and stuff, that there's a particular class of kid who has trouble that I think is an order of magnitude more challenging than anything else. And that's the young teenage girl who just ends up having to run away, just can't fit in, you know, mm. just can't fit in. And I think that's, you know, and I and I knew of a few of those folks where we where we where we raised our kids, and to me, the courage and 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 difficulty of what they dealt with was always just stunning to me. And as I wrote this story, I wanted to have a character who was really strong. And to me, the strongest people are you know those those if if you know I, I knew parents whose 13 year old daughter your age daughter at age you know ran away and lived in the streets for months in another city and i can't imagine what the parents went through let alone what this kid went through to survive you know and you can judge it you can say whatever you want but the truth is that that form of survival takes a certain kind of grit and steel that i think you know many people don't have so that's what happened and as far as the characters and and so on they they came to me whatever their whatever's wasn't like i sat down and thought about how how should sarah be it was more i did i did about three years of research to start this series and wow. when i actually started the series it was in a writing i thought i ought to take a writing class if i'm serious about this stuff and we in the writing class an evening writing class i took at the university of washington the first exercise we did was a write for three minutes and that's I started writing and that, that was the first few paragraphs of what's now the book Strongheart, the first book in the series. And so that's how it started. And, and, and I just wrote what I saw. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's more complicated than that because it took me 
four months to write the first draft and then three years to get the story right. You know, wow. it's not, so it took me 11 years to write the series and, and, and it just, there's a certain amount of seasoning and anyway, it's, it's, so that's what happened. And, and so long as, and I've had, I've had, I've had, my stories have strong women in them. Yes. Because my, my wife pointed out to me some of my earlier books didn't have strong women in them. What the hell's wrong with you? So I think, well, you're right. So I'll try. And, but they, these stories are liked, especially liked, I think, by women because the women characters with one exception are really strong and they're women doing things that um, you don't really expect. For example, in my third book, Totem, one of the women characters, Louise, she's the daughter of a guy who had an, a salvage tug company. And so she's basically a tug operator, mm. right? And you don't usually think about that, right? So that's the, I was trying to do something which was showed, okay, what, what, what happens if you have a bunch of strong women thrown into situations, which traditionally you do with men, but again, it's all back to the, the story. You know, you want a good story. I, 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 regular listeners will be, oh, here he goes with that question again. But I'm going to ask, when male writers, it's, it's a very big trend these days for male writers to have female heroines. And, it, and that, this is crossing all genres that I interview with. And I'm talking mystery thriller genre. I'm talking suspense. I'm talking uh, literary I'm t and adventure, sea, sea adventure now. Um, I, so it, it, you've already kind of answered the question. It's not like you said, I'm going to make it a female heroine. It just became the point where you thought, no, this is more natural as to what I wanted to do. But have you, have you kind of, do you see the point of that question? Are you seeing that yourself? Or what are your thoughts on that? Because I, mean, I, I do appreciate what you said about how a man, you know, saying a man can't write about a woman, et cetera. I, I find all of that stuff ridiculousness, but uh, overcorrection might be the word I would use. But anyway, what are your thoughts though on 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 that in general? Was it a conscious decision? I, I can tell already it wasn't like a marketing decision, right? No, it just had nothing to do with marketing. It just it was just to tell the right the right story. Um, uh, I'd say honestly, and, and this is based on my limited you know, the whole other part of this is book promotion and trying to understand that, which I loathe. I can't tell you how I loathe it. And it's very hard to be noticed, but it does seem to me today, as opposed to 50 years ago, many, many that the publishing business seems to be more controlled by women these days than by men. Most of the writers you see in many series are women and not men. It seems, mm -hmm. Yeah. you know, and I've gone to, uh, you know, and I've gone to a number of, um, play, I've gone to library conferences where librarians are tend to mostly be women, not men. Mm -hmm. You you go to uh, book publisher companies, and you know men are involved, but there are a lot of women. So I think one issue is just that women may be the biggest group of readers for some of these books. I mean, it could yeah. be, you know, yeah. and and uh, um, so that's what I'd say. Yeah. I told, and I appreciate that. And I, I totally agree with you because really we, all we can do as individuals is pretty be anecdotal about this, but I've observed the same thing. And um, it's funny. I have two podcasts. I have this show and I have another show called PR after hours for my day job, public relations, marketing, the kind right, of, right. that's overwhelmingly men, the business, the business one, this show, the, the guests are overwhelmingly women and, and the readership or the listenership is the same. So I, I totally just here, I can confirm that just based on my own anecdotal evidence too. But I just, I always like to ask male writers who do that. And I'll say, but I say this too, and the readers are grown or listeners are groaning. I I'm still working on finding that feminine voice in my fiction. Um, but I'm my series that I've written is going to be book eight. It's going to be out about the same time as your book, by the way, oh, okay. the, your next book. And it's the last, oh gosh, I just said it. It's probably the last of that series. And I'm going to move on to something else. And I have a female heroine in mind simply because i think um it's better for the story like you just said so i'm always there's always a reason i ask that question it's not me just trying to be an overt sexist asking a you know a prehistoric man kind of question i'm just curious about uh, your take on it. so well let me let me just say this though I, i'm curious about this uh your books are very well reviewed kirk has said that uh, strong heart was rife with secrets and hidden depths said that a drift is a stirring rich tale of spirituality grit and danger and you have a not just a fair amount, but a very good amount of reader reviews. Um, besides the fact that you write damn good books, obviously, what's your secret to getting all these reviews? Well, that's, an... <laughs> oh man. Well, <laughs> I, I think, you know, these days I'd say, and this isn't going to be a surprise to anybody, with so many books, I think there's 70,000 books a year produced. And 
Now the Amazon total number of novels is like 17 million. It's something unbelievable. So Crazy. now the question is, how do you get noticed? How do you get seen? And I'd say that most of my, I'm not, I'm kind of a dinosaur when it comes to social media. Yeah. Uh, I do the best I can, but, but, you know, I'm just, I'm an old white guy who's going to listen to me really. Um, I have a few little niches. I've, you know, people like see stories, enjoy my books. I've, but the real, I think the secret to me in terms of getting all these reviews and was that I stumbled on this group called the online book club um, run by this guy, Scott Hughes in Connecticut. Yeah. And this was yeah. about four years ago. Yeah. He had 150,000 members and now he has over 3 million members. Right. And I invested some money with him. I, I, yeah. I, I signed up for early on for book of the month where my book was featured on his website for a month. And hmm. part of that is part of the deal there is, um, you give a PDF file of your book to him and he gets it out to, he has lots of people who are readers. In fact, probably, I think large, a large group of his members are looking for free books and that's okay. fine. Okay. Yeah. So I've had strong has been out the longest. I have almost 500 reviews on strong at least on Amazon. And I have about right. 150 of a drift and totem just starting. I got the first review for them and that's going to, I'm going to getting many of those coming. And so um, that's, so I have this, it's, it's a little bit weird. I have, there's a, I have a fairly large international readership, you know, who through this online book club, right. right who, are, who are following the series. And then of course, I try to focus on the Pacific Northwest and people who like to read about the Pacific Northwest because these are tales set in the Pacific Northwest. Right. Um, I mean, it's, uh, I'm retired now, but it, you, you need to keep a day job. It's not like I'm selling a lot of books traditional way, right? Right. It's a struggle yeah, you. getting your books in bookstores, right. but but I'm getting some pretty good readership, and I and I'm getting great reaction to people. So that's you know that's and that's all you can ask for. No, you know I I just to dip my toe in on. That's funny you said that online book club recently, and uh, you know the reviewers are not playing around there. By the way, I've noticed that I had a review done, um, and it made me took a hard look in the mirror about one of my oldest books and it was good i'm glad i did it because um even though it's been around for almost 13 years there was some couple of things that needed fixing and i'm glad i could go back and fix them but i like that that group and i think your your wife's to do it uh, i think i will look into the the book of the month as well down the road um kirkus though if you if you found i th i still think i don't care how you arrive at getting kirkus to review your book i think that it still carries some weight what do you think well, let me first of all say that that I these books are not self-published. I mean, I have a publisher, right? Iron Twine Press. I mean, he's he's a very small publisher, and and you could argue it's effectively like being self-published. But he and I work together, and sure. he's been a great support to me. And and the reason, the benefit of having a publisher, among others, is with a publisher you can get into bookstores with a return policy if the books don't sell which is huge and you can't yeah. do that if it's self published all right so um i've done that and so each time i've done a book he's he's gotten the kirkus review and i got one for strong art i got one for a drift and now i i just got the kirkus review for totem and i mean you couldn't sit down and hire someone to write a better review for a book than what this these people did it was unbelievable yeah. and so that's been great and and what happens in those those reviews are third-party reviews publisher right. reviews and that's what the bookstore trade looks to you know they don't you know they, they they need that as far as i know again i don't know anything about this i'm just guessing in some of these things but it does seem that having a kirkus review get your toe in the door with, yeah. with at least a bookstore buyer considering your book. Now, I mean, we could go on for a long time. I, mean, I literally drove around the Northwest 8,000 miles and went to every one of 150 bookstores with Strongheart trying to get them to carry Strongheart. And it wasn't very cost effective because the book buyer might not be there. They don't know who I am. They're coming off the street. I left a few in consignment. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's kind of a mystery how this all works. Yeah. I'm just hoping by being persistent, <laughs> it'll, it'll help. 
I love this. So you have this, and I know we can't go into it, but you've had this odyssey of visiting all these uh, indie oh, bookstores, yeah. which is, oh, yeah. that alone has got to be a great story, you know? Well, it's been, it's been, it's been pretty interesting. And, and what I learned by going through that, which is hard as it is to be a writer. I mean, those people, man. Oh yeah. That, that's got to be a labor of love. I mean, they're all doing little coffee shops now and other ways to make a little extra money. And I don't know how they, any of them survived this pandemic. Yeah. And, you know, they're all very individual. And of course, you realize pretty quickly that really, if you want to sell a book on, in a bookstore and you're not a well-known author, there's a very limited area yeah. where you need to get on the table where they can see the cover of your book. And there's only a limited amount of space that they'll right. devote to that. And if you can't get your cover to be cover visible as opposed to spine out, good luck. Yeah. So it's it's not easy. Right. And I don't yeah. like, you know, anyway, so, you know, all you can do, at least in my opinion, all, I, I do the best I can yeah. this time with Totem. I set a launch date well in advance. And when the book was finished, I've got it in the pipeline for many, many reviews. I mean, I'm getting, I'm doing it a little bit better. Um, but again, it, again, it's just a matter of people noticing yeah, absolutely. It's why I've been doing podcasts, quite honestly, because there yeah. may be some people in your audience who might otherwise never stumble to this, who might say, oh, I'll, I'll take a look. And that's all I'm asking. Take yeah, a look. It's, it's, an, it's a quick, it's an investment of just a, a little bit of your time to talk about, you know, talk about right. you and your books, which I think, I think that's why people should go on talk, podcasts. But, you know, it's funny, I did, my, my book was in a number of indie stores, or a couple of my books were, and then finally I got to one where a guy said, I'm pulling you because I see you're on Amazon too. And I'm just like, dude, I can't make a living just on your independent bookstore. And I, I hate to do that because I love indie bookstores and I, and I support them as best I can. I've done a lot of book signings, but there's just this real, it's not every, but not all indies do that. But the last indie bookstore I was in a few years ago just said, well, we're, we have a policy now. If you're on Amazon too, we're not going to, we're not going to shelve you. And I thought, well, okay. I, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about that other than, you know, I don't, I mean, I might've sold a couple of books a year through them and I sell way more through Amazon. I hate that. I hate to have to capitulate to that, but it seems to be where the market is. Well, I think that's a dilemma. Yeah. For example, um, my, my webpage where you can read about all the books and read the background information you've been reading. Um, if you click on the webpage, the landing page, if that's the right phrase, right away, right. what comes up yeah. are links to all three books through the indie bookstore referral system, right? That's first the thing first I thing noticed. you see. And yeah. then from there you go to, each of the books, right? You can read about the books and you, so you can go as deep as you want or not. Okay. Now, earlier version of that web page had, instead of just the picture of the cover, had a picture of the cover, which was the Amazon link. So you could read inside or buy it. And then right. I'm thinking, okay, that's good. Maybe for people who are buying the book, but as you say, bookstores are going to think, wait a minute, you know, do I want to do this? So because I'm trying to move my books now through bookstores, I reformatted the link. I, here's the way I think about it. Everybody knows about Amazon. If they're going to buy from Amazon, they'll just click on Amazon, look up the book. Right? So true. So I'm just, so I'm just putting on, I want people to go through indie bookstores. So that's what I'm putting on the webpage. There's nothing on Amazon on my page. It's all it, it's, it's, it's about indie bookstores. Um, but the book is on Amazon. I mean, you can't not have it I mean, for the ebook. You have to. So it's, right. it's, it's a bit of a dilemma. And honestly, I think that it's a moving target. I think bookstores are trying to adjust as this goes on because, you know, they, some of them early on wouldn't have anything to do with Amazon, but then they now, now five years later, they have to, because of, you know, it's, it's a, it's a dilemma. It is. Yeah. And by the way, I don't hold any grudge about that. I told him, I said, I, I get it. You're in a survival right. situation here. And uh, I always would point him there. Um, but anyway, it, w w I appreciate you indulging me in a lot of this kind of behind the scenes talk about writing and marketing. I, I know it's not everybody's fun topic, but a lot of the listeners who are writers, I, I get these questions all the time because right, right. they see somebody like Charlie Sheldon who has an, a lot of good reviews and they want to know, how did he do it? So, well, and I always say the first answer is, as, as I said earlier, he writes damn good books. But um, as, as we start to transition here, unfortunately, and our, our trail might be coming to an end soon, I've got to ask you, though, when you go out in an Olympic, do you go by yourself? 
uh, on your hikes? Usually. usually. Really? Um, that's there's two answers to this, several answers to that question. I no, I don't always go alone. I mean, I've gone with other people. I had a few people I went with every year for at least one 10 day trip a year, and there'd be two or three of us. But I tend to go alone. I've always done this alone, and I'll go off. And I've even gone off trail alone. I have a beacon with me, okay. so if I get in trouble, um, I have a beacon with me. I know that people would tut tut at me and shake their fingers and say, "What are you doing?" But that's that's what I do. I don't go. I don't. At the, my current age, seventy four, I don't do the same stuff I did at fifty. Right. right. Um, I'm pretty careful. I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm noticing now that I, going downhill is a little harder than it used to be for me, but I want to, I even went out Yes, I went out last year at the end of September alone for five days, looking for the unnamed lake. Unnamed lake. I saw the video. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, and it was a tough trip, but, and I'm trying to get ready to do a tough trip today. And I'm walking around with this loaded pack. And I was just saying to my wife, Jesus, I don't know. It gets harder every year, but you know, it's, it's, it's nice out there. So that's what I do. <laughs> hey, don't get me wrong. I, I'm going this weekend on a kayaking trip in deep, deep into the Mark Twain National Forest here in Missouri. Okay. okay. And I mean, I've been out on 26 mile kayaks with buddies and you didn't see any other humans for at least 10 of those miles. So I get right. that, but I was not alone. The last time I went alone, I used to go bouldering smart kayak, right? My twenties right. by myself. And then I nearly got bit by a rattlesnake once. And wow. I thought, I don't think I should. This was back before cell phones and GPS and all that crap. Right. So I, I'm going to stop. But when I saw the video of you talking about the unnamed lake, okay, and you're talking, that's a little sketchy. I don't know if I want to go try to do that. I, I just thought, gosh, is he alone? And I'm not saying it because of your years, okay, Charlie. I'm not saying that at yeah, all. Yeah. I'm saying it because just right. I mean, people go missing, and you know, one wrong move, and you fall the wrong way. It could be really bad. So you've got this beacon, which which is great, and you've got, obviously, the smarts and the survival skills if something goes a little pear-shaped, I guess. But you, do, I guess the question is, you don't have any fear about it, do you? Well, I, I mean, I don't know how you describe that. I mean, I, I'm not afraid of animals or that sort of thing. I mean, right. yeah, you, you have enough fear to be cautious. Well, no, no, right? I don't mean like you're, you're being crazy stupid because you have, you know, I have no fear. I'll walk up to that grizzly and pat it on the head. But I just mean, you're not like a lot of people just be the whole idea of going alone into the wilderness for any length of time would be filled with trepidation. Well, I remember once I was on a hike a few years ago and I started falling into the mindset of thinking there was something following me. And when you start thinking that way, it gets really uncomfortable. You know, your yeah. back starts prickling and you start turning around and then it's kind of a do loop you get caught in. Right. Right. Um, and so I, I don't want to go there, you know, but I think here's another comment. And this, this is my grandfather, um, who was very old when my father was born. And, and so he was doing this stuff in the first decade of the 20th century, 1906, 1907. He ended up doing, he did a lot of, uh, backcountry hiking and hunting alone and he always went alone and he did some gnarly trips so we had a tradition sort of in my family that this is what what you did but the other comment i'd make is yeah it's dangerous to do anything alone i understand that but we become such a protected you know helicopter kind of society and yeah. i'm sorry you know i think back to the point about human beings i mean until very recently I'm sorry to say this, but life was cheap. People, I mean, stuff happened that was bad and it was, it was tough. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's the, and it's, it's still tough. It's just people like to think it isn't, you know? And so, yeah, people can tut tut to me about, you know, you shouldn't go alone. And I understand that. I don't want to be out there and have to rely on a helicopter to come to get me. That'd be the embarrassing part of it. But I, <laughs> I, I, I try to be, and I don't, but I don't take the risks today that I might have taken 40 years ago for sure yeah you know yeah. And there are I'm sorry to say this but nobody knows about this but there's a group of people out here in the Olympics who go alone all the time and they don't use trails they just head off cross country to the worst gnarliest stuff you can imagine wow. and there's probably a dozen of them and nobody knows about these guys but you know those are the guys who are risk takers <laughs> <laughs> so well and, 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 and boy i hope i didn't make you think that i thought you were reckless by any means i well, i've been reckless I, 
Oh, well, I just, I, I, I think what I was trying to do, and hopefully I didn't, I guess I didn't express it too well, was that much respect to have for you for doing it. Cause I, I do agree. Uh, I'm in my, my, uh, I'm 53 and it, it really clicked on me, in me a few years ago. There's nothing guaranteed. And yeah, we, we kind of have this illusion, a lot of us modern people, you know, that, oh, you know, we shouldn't have any kind of risk in our lives and that, 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 that it's an anomaly for something bad to happen to people when I, it sounds terrible to say it, but I, I kind of realized no bad stuff happens a lot to people, even people who don't ask for it, so to speak. And when I started uh, the past uh, five, six years going into nature, that became very apparent to me, e even actually just when I would observe how just creatures in the river interacting, eating each other right, 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 and, and right. all that it's, it's like, it's a, I, I'm not expressing well, but it's a real eye opener. <laughs> well, that I mean, if you go back to the thesis in this whole series of books that right. stories made us human, it was the telling of stories that made us modern human beings, that ancient legends might be true, that there's value in what the ancient people did that we could perhaps use today. What we forget is their life was, when one level it wasn't so hard, but another level it was brutal. Yeah. You know, you had glaciers, you had huge animals you had um diseases you had volcanoes you had fire. and and i think what happened for hundreds of thousands of years where there were not very many humans and oftentimes these small groups would be wiped out by by these animals they had to live in protected places maybe along the shore and islands because they couldn't live on the mainland because short-faced bears and, and the other animals would get them and i think this went on for for uh tens of thousands of years until finally, you know, either through climate, the big animals died or groups of people gathered together and were able to, you know, get them, make them all extinct. And so um, our human nature today is based, I mean, you know, we're, we're human beings, right? So we're courageous and we're loyal and we're empathetic, but we're also vengeful and acquisitive and corrupt and, you know, and our nature hasn't changed from all those years ago, but we have, but, but now we're built a society where we're trying to pretend like we could be we can live forever and everybody can be protected forever and you've got all this all these things to keep people safe well i'm sorry but you you know at some point it's up to you <laughs> so anyway i i i'm i was trying in some way to say in all these stories that maybe there were some things in the ancient times that helped us survive rather than yeah. just to move us along to today. And we might be better off today looking at some of that stuff in some ways. Charlie Sheldon, I, what a blessing to have you on this show. Cause I, and I know I threw a lot of stuff at you from a lot of angles and you just, you just hit them right down the middle every time. I appreciate that so much. So uh, as of today, this is uh, October 28th. As of this show uh, airing your it's totem airs officially. The big drop is tomorrow, correct? That's correct. That's Tell me, correct. okay, and I don't know if we were clear, and I want to make sure I didn't uh, shortchange you. Strongheart is the first book, Adrift is the second, and then Totem drops tomorrow. Um, now, you, we've already discussed uh, independent bookstores. Would you recommend, though, and what would you like us to do here if uh, you want to get all, and folks, you can't buy this third book and not buy the first two. You might as well get all three of them. So, Charlie, you want to send them to your website and have them buy them through an independent bookstore? Is that the ideal uh, direction you'd like to go? That would that would probably be the ideal direction. They're standalone books. You don't need, right. you, but but it's preferable to read them in order. But it, it doesn't matter. Kirkus even said about Totem, it's a standalone book and it's the third book. And it's, by the way, twice as long as the other two. It's twice the book. But I would say I encourage people to order through their bookstore, buy through their bookstore. Now, obviously, if they're ebook readers, they're going to order it through Kindle or, you know, some ebook thing. Of course, I understand that. Sure. But, but for people who like to read printed books, you know, yeah, order them through the bookstore. You can go to my, you can go to my webpage or just go down to your local bookstore and, and they can look the book up and they'll order it for you. And it'll be there in a couple of days. You know, Charlie, that's something I need to start saying more about mine is, you know what, if you want the, if you're an ebook reader, go to Amazon, please do. But if you want the actual book, uh, it, 
in a paperback or hardback form, go to your local bookstore and order it because that way they can make a little money on it and they can order it and, and everybody's a little bit better. I love that idea. But if you are looking for that, you know, it's real simple, folks. You're just going to go to Charlie Sheldon, numeral two. So it's charliesheldon2.com. Um, there will be a link in the show notes, of course. Now, when you go there, this is a great site. It's really easy to navigate. You're going to have reviews. You're going to have his stuff on humilities, uh, Olympic Peninsula tales, sea stories, real or folk tale, all this great stuff from Charlie Sheldon. And I, it's a treat. I'm telling you, um, it's as much fun, almost as much fun as having him right here in our mysterious goings on grotto or whatever we call this thing. Charlie, <laughs> thank you so very much for joining us. And, and man, best of luck with tomorrow's book launch. Well, thanks a lot. And that only other little comment I made is Charlie Sheldon, I-E, C-H-A-R-L-I-E-S-H-E-L-D-O-N. Oh, oh, right. right. Some people okay. say E-Y and the number two. Yeah, it would be great. And, and uh, most people who read these books like them. And that's all you can ask for. I mean, the, the greatest praise an author can receive is I fell into your book and I, I couldn't put it down. And that that's, that's the high, high, highest praise you can ask for. I've been lucky enough to hear it from a few people. And uh, I think people will like the series. You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. I'm not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors you're not paying monthly hosting fees the sound quality is great the distribution is phenomenal friends download the free anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started remember you heard it here first on mysterious goings on Okay, who has a podcast, then writes an ebook about podcasting and doesn't do an audiobook version of it? Well, not me. I've done that. In fact, I'm very excited to tell you, dear listeners, that the podcast option, my recent top selling ebook on podcasting, my journey through 15 years as a podcaster, broadcaster, host, guest, and observer, is now an audible audiobook. It's really, really, really exciting for me to be able to present this to you through Audible, uh, which is available on Amazon.com, where the ebook link is as well. And in this fast listen, my experience uh, comes to you through stories, practical tips, and advice from my hundreds of hours as a guest, producer, podcast host, and more. And the podcast option, if I say so myself, is mandatory listening for those new to podcasting, and it should be a welcome addition to veteran podcasters' library. So. Check out the podcast option read by yours truly, Alex Greenwood, or as they say there, the J. Alexander Greenwood, because that's my pen name. And that's a long story, which if you dig through my podcast, eventually you'll find out what that means. But the point being today, the podcast option is available now as an audible audiobook. I've got a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. Please do me a favor. Go get that audiobook. Or if audiobooks aren't your bag, there's also a link for you to get it as an ebook. Again, the podcast option. I certainly hope you will choose it. Thanks so much for listening to Mysterious Goings On. Don't forget we have a complete archive of all of our interviews, monologues, updates, live readings, dead readings. All of that stuff is available at mgopod.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to us so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual suspects. Please join us there. Again, don't forget, mgopod.com also has links where to find me on social media and how to get in touch in case you want to be a guest here on the show. Well, I think it's time that I move on for this week, but until next time. 
keep reading.